Welcome back to another Q&A video. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Post some questions down below and I will answer them all next week. So let's get started. First question. Just started doing heavy rack pulls above the knee and the bar really drags along my legs, quads, all the way up. It hurts like hell, leaves nasty bruising, and today has resulted in strange gross lumps. Is this normal or am I doing something wrong? Okay, the bruising is quite normal. Especially when it's like right above your kneecap because you don't really have a lot of muscle in that region where the meat of the quads is It's kind of like mid thigh. Okay, so when it's right above your kneecap Yeah, you're gonna get some bruising there and it's just part of the game now You're saying that you're getting a lump. It's really painful and you're, it's like really not agreeing with you. That sounds quite weird I don't know if you have any skin issues, but That should not be happening. What you should see is some bruising. That's normal You're gonna have two bruises on each leg, but the pain will eventually go away you know, maybe after like two weeks of doing the rack pulls, you just won't feel it anymore. And actually, the bruising will go away after that point. It's the same thing with zercher lifts. When I used to do zerchers, I used to get a lot of bruising on my forms and red marks. Now, I could do zerchers every day. I don't get anything. In fact, I don't have pain at all. No pain, no bruising, nothing. So it's about adapting. You have to adapt to the weight being pressed against your thighs like that. Now, if it really is a problem that continues to persist, then discontinue the usage of rack pulls above the knee. Just switch up the variation. Maybe do below the knee rack pulls, like right below your kneecap. This way you're still getting some pretty good weights in, you know, or consider switching up the variation to Jefferson or trap bar. With trap bar, neutral grip, it's never gonna hit your legs. That's what I really like, especially for shrugs. And the Jefferson is right underneath you. So I would recommend incorporating different styles of rack pulls, uh, whether it's below the knee or above the knee, to see if that reduces what you're experiencing right now. So hope that helps you out, and next question. My question is, why should I even build a strong deadlift before doing rack pulls? If I do rack pulls and box squats, wouldn't I have better development than the legs, upper back, and traps? Well, the way I see it, and of course I gotta quote Louis Simmons on this, a pyramid is only as tall as its base. In other words, your foundation is key. And the rack pull, I'm assuming you're talking about doing above the knee, is really not required as a novice, right? If you really are a beginner, Guys, I'm not over exaggerating. You can add 10 to 20 pounds to your deadlift per workout. Some people think that's unrealistic, but dude, it's totally realistic. I've seen it happen hundreds and hundreds of times from guys following my free novice program. So you can add 10, 20 pounds a workout. Why would you do rack pull above the knee? What you have to understand is this, man. Like, you're not going to get hurt, okay, because it's really, really light loads. You're building up your base, you're building up that mindless connection, you're building up the form, and it's going to serve you more than doing a partial when you're just a beginner, okay? Once you could deadlift like between three and four plates, which will not take a long time to do, I can assure you, start doing some rock pulls. Make the switch if you want. I just don't see why, logically, you'd be doing a, a partial like that if you just don't have a base, there's no point. You will make great gains, your upper back and traps will thick enough to do these deadlifts, and when you start doing the rock pulls, you'll immediately be able to put up 100 pounds more just right off the bat. So if you tap out, say, a 4 or 5 deadlift, well, now when you start doing the rock pulls, you'll already be at 500, and you didn't have to work up to it. You didn't have to train for that specifically, understand? It's about general strength carryover. So, yeah, I mean, you can get away with just, with just doing box squats and rack pulls. That's going to work fine if you're a novice. But I have to question, why would you do that? Why would you do that knowing that you can add 10, 20 pounds to your pull every workout, and it's not going to get you injured? And it's going to build your base. I mean, it's also going to have better carry over the rows and stuff like that. So to me, focus on your pose. It doesn't have to be a conventional deadlift. It could be a trap bar deadlift, a sumo deadlift, any type of full range of motion pole. Well, quote unquote full range. Since it's determined by the plate size. But regardless, focus on a full range of motion pole. And then start introducing rock pulls. Now, let's say you're not talking about above the knee. Then, okay, fine. You can do block pulls of lower heights. Maybe a below the knee rock pull. Fine, I have no problem with that. No problem. Or a four inch block pull, no problem. It's still very good range of motion. It's actually, yeah, one might argue that it's actually better for that. But the reason why I don't recommend this is because you just don't need it. You got to build your base. But if you really want to go ahead and do that, fine, be my guest. What kind of periodization do you recommend for someone who's crossing the line between novice and intermediate? Okay, if I can go back in time, I would have never dealt with the linear periodization. The only good thing about doing that is that I have enough experience to tell you that there's better ways. In my honest opinion, Concurrent prioritization is superior for most people, for general strength, for injury prevention, for busting through plateaus. It's just plain better. That's my opinion. You can disagree. You can reference all the elite powerlifters you want. 
For my personal belief system, for the vast majority of recreational lifters, they will benefit far more with this approach. I believe that with linear periodization, you're going to have all kinds of stalls, and it's just not worth it. All kinds of muscular imbalances. You're not going to be the most jacked version of yourself. There are so many cons that actually I do discuss in Naturally Enhanced in the first chapter that uh, I just I don't, I don't like it. And you can also look into the West Side Barbell Conjuring System if you want to learn more about the cons of linear periodization. But I'm not a fan of it. I know there's a lot of guys who are stronger than me that use it, but for me, I don't like it. So what I recommend for you, straight into concurrent. Just straight into it, man. Volume day, intensity day, doing your GPP work, rotating the special exercises, choosing specific movements that are similar to your competition lift, and just build from there. To me, like you're never going to have plateaus. This way, it's going to be PRs every single workout. You're going to become the most jacked version of yourself. It's going to be all the accessory work that you need to succeed. You can never go wrong with concurrent, all right? So... That's my personal belief. Again, you have the right to disagree. You can reference me all these guys you want. But based off my experience and the experience that I've witnessed among real naturals following this channel, it never seemed to be the most optimal thing. So I'm pro-concurrent. I'm pro-conjugate system 100%. That's what I'm always going to recommend to you guys. I believe it's far superior for the vast majority of lifters. You still believe in doing pushdowns before extensions to warm up the elbows? Or if I do presses first, is that not necessary? I absolutely recommend that 100%. Uh, the extension, a lot of people are ego lifting on it. They're going way too heavy and they're not correctly warming up. And that's why they have a bunch of elbow pain. Guys, I have hypermobility in the elbows, which is an extreme case. Mine is not like regular people. It really, really hyper extends. Yet I can still do extensions without pain. Why? Well, I warm up correctly for one. So I don't just jump into 135. No, I'll start with an empty bar. I'll do that for 10 reps. I'll do empty bar again for 10 reps. Maybe I'll do 15 for 10 reps, 95. I'll basically ramp it up like that. And before I do my extensions, I'm doing push downs. I used to reverse the order, okay? Back in the day, I would do my extensions first, push downs after. Now I do it the other way around because now I get more out of less weight and the elbows feel just so much better. So I recommend, yeah, do your push downs before your extensions, warm up thoroughly. You're not gonna have any elbow pain whatsoever and you're gonna get more out of less weight. I get lower back pain from box squats. How do I fix it? Okay, you're probably rounding into the box, okay? Very common mistake, but when you're sitting down, you're rolling. You're kind of flexing your spine and that's what's cr creating the back pain. Yeah. Also, because the box squat, you're, you're sitting on it, you're likely relaxing your spine too much. You're not bracing correctly. So what you have is a situation where you're sitting back, you're rounding into the box. So you're rolling, which is causing a lot of pressure on the lower back and you don't have that core tightness going on. That's why you're getting lower back pain. A good way to remedy that is by doing the front box squat. Why? Well, it's going to maintain thoracic extension and you'll have to be tight 100% of the time and you will not be able to lean back as much. So it's going to prevent you from rolling in in a sense. So start doing those for a little bit and then go back to the regular version. See if that helps. That's just one recommendation I can give you. How do I breathe when performing the bench press? It's uh, quite simple. You want to do it the power lift away. So you're grabbing onto the bar. You do Valsava. <gasps> drag it out. It's over your belly, deep breath again. <gasps> you can hold your breath in the entire rep or you can exhale like when it's halfway up, whatever you like. But I recommend two deep breaths, one to unrack, one to do the press. Some guys, they do one whole breath. So they'll unrack with that deep breath, they'll bring it down and they'll just press through. And then they might exhale or they might not exhale. So those are just a few different ways of doing it. But uh, when guys say inhale on the way down, exhale on the way up, you're losing out that tightness, which is very important. If you want to really maximize how much weight you could do, you want to have that stomach tight. Would you alter naturally enhance for people over 40? Nope. And I've had guys in their 40s, 50s, and even 60s run the program with tremendous success. I've had older guys messaging me saying, Alex, your program changed my life. I'm injury free and I'm making the best strength gains in years. Swear to God. And these guys didn't have to change anything for the most part. The only recommendation that I would give for you is to, instead of doing the one rep maxes every week, just do it Matt Wedding style. Lower the percentage about 85, 90%, maybe even 80 if you want to go that route. And just do singles, but don't go overly heavy. In other words, treat the max effort work as strength endurance rather than like 100% absolute strength. And if you do that way, I think you're going to be a, a bit more safe, obviously, and it's going to put less wear and tear on your body. So that would be my only recommendation. Uh, the volume also, you don't have to go as high. You don't have to be doing 10 by 10s. A simple 3 by 10 or a 5 by 10, perfectly doable. But beyond that, you're going to be perfectly, perfectly fine, my friend. It's only twice a week, full body. You can do your GPP workout, your mini home workouts. Honestly, 
This system is so good for older men. It's so good for all athletes who are trying to prioritize recovery. It's good for pretty much everyone. Like when you run natural enhance, what you will notice is that you're going to get bigger and stronger, but your recovery is going to be amazing. Like it just, it does not drain you. Guys think that because you're going heavy on a weekly basis that you get drained, but it doesn't do that. I'm telling you, when you run this program, you're going to feel amazing 24-7. You're not going to feel run down because of the way that everything is structured with the volume and the intensity, the rotation of movements, and the fact that it's twice a week full body. What guys don't understand is that you're using the same nervous system. So when guys come in, they're doing these, uh, these high-frequency programs to have them hitting twice a week muscle protein synthesis, what they fail to understand is that, number one, there's going to be some crossover from other muscle groups, and two, you're using the same nervous system, which causes breakdown of the body. And that's why Leroy Colbert, if you watch some of his older videos, may he rest in peace, he always said, with full body, everything recovers together. Because it is the same nervous system. It is. So... You're going to have superior recovery when you run this. And I have no doubt in my mind as a 40-year-old male or over 40, whatever age you might be, you're going to love it. Do you have to squat to increase your deadlift? No, you don't. There's a lot of guys who do push-pull meets, for instance. They'll do bench press and deadlift. Okay? In fact, you're looking at a guy right over here that hasn't done squats in years. Actually, I started doing some variations now for some athletic performance gains. But for the most part. I didn't do any squats, and my deadlift was at its highest. I did 655 hack deadlift off the floor. Even my conventional went up to sumo. You saw me do 585, and I never did any sumos. Like, that was, like, my third time ever doing it in my life. Trap bar deadlift, you saw me pull 700 off the high handles, 605 low handles. Basically, all these heavy pulls that I've done, the, the way that I brought them up was by doing heavy pulls. I never had to fucking squat. Now, is that optimal? Probably not. I think you get better gains if you include squats. But all I'm trying to say is that you can get a strong pull without squatting. You absolutely can. There's a lot of guys who are just really good at deadlifts, but they suck at the squat. Provided you're building up the muscle groups and you're training a specific way, you're going to be fine. The deadlift, it really is the most like absolute, if you ask me. It's not as technical. It's more of like a raw animal strength type builder. So if you just build those muscle groups, that's why a lot of West Side guys have amazing deadlifts. That, that kind of explains it, you know? So yeah, you can just do deadlifts if you want. You don't have to do squats, although I, I would recommend it probably. But based off my experience and what I've seen from a lot of strong guys, you don't have to do it. It's proof. You don't have to do it. Strictly leg size, is the grass squat better or parallel squats with more weight? You see, this is a tricky question, man. It's so hard to say. It's very hard to say. Because they're very, very similar. Now, I know some guys are going to reference studies consisting of fucking noobs. But let's be honest here. When you're an advanced lifter and you're squatting in the fives, for example, you, it's not going to make like a day and night difference with doing an acid grass or a parallel. If anything, it's going to be the same gains. So from that perspective, maybe the acid grass is more worth it because you can get more out of less weight, you know. And I would actually argue that it's safer as well because you really have to use correct form when you're doing that and it requires uh, greater mobility. And you're not going to be uh, cheating the lift because a lot of guys, when you do parallel squats, as the reps go on, it ends up becoming above parallel. And I, I find personally for me, whenever I did parallel free squats, I got knee pain from that. I just didn't feel good. I, I always had to go below parallel or ass to grass. Ass to grass is always my favorite position. Whenever I do ass to grass, my knees feel amazing. My legs feel amazing. So that's what I prefer to do. But if we're talking purely about leg size and strength, I don't think you're going to see a significant difference from just going 90 degrees or ass to grass, provided that you're, you're going like really heavy on both. So if you do an ass to grass squat with like 500 and a parallel squat with 550, I, I don't see how that's going to be significant. I don't. Maybe among a noob, like if you take a noob, yeah, you're going to see big differences. But among advanced lifters, I, I think you'll be just fine. So do whatever feels best for you. If you want to do parallel, I recommend doing it off a box. It'll eliminate much of the knee pain if you happen to get some. And it's going to be consistent all the time. And it's going to be a great strength build overall, especially if you're not a power lifter. So... Yeah, I don't think you're going to see a huge difference. And in regards to strength, it is like joint angle specific. Maybe the parallel is going to be better for sprinting, uh, uh, vertical jump, and even fighting. Because you're never going to go in acid grass position when you're, when you're battling someone, you know. If anything, you're going to lunge at them. So, yeah, we can talk about that from the strength perspective. But in terms of hypertrophy, I don't think it's as significant as some people make it to be. I really don't. What are your thoughts on water fasting? I plan on doing it every day after my ACL surgery since I won't be moving much. I think water fasting is fine, but I would strongly recommend that you include electrolytes to it, okay? Don't just do plain water fasting or else you're going to feel like shit. And um, I would not overdo the fast as well, especially if you're relatively lean. Now, if you're overweight, 
you can extend the fast, okay? But if you're really, really lean, man, like 48, 72 hours maximum, okay? And with that, you should be fine. Don't overexert yourself. Pay attention to how you're feeling. And like I said, you need to add those electrolytes, man. Plain water fasting will make you feel like garbage, okay? And if you want, you could also do like a carb loading right before your fast. We can have full muscle glycogen storages, okay? So have like 500 grams of carbs the night before you start, okay? Have a bunch of veggies, get that stomach full, and then do your 48 or 72 and make sure that you add like electrolytes to your drink. So add potassium uh, and sodium in particular, you know, and you can add other things too. Just make sure it's uh, zero calories and you should be fine. But yeah, if you're lean, I wouldn't go m more than like 48, 72 hours. Okay. So yeah, next question. Do you think with an insane level of neck and yoke training, someone could be immune to death by hanging? Yes. Well, not necessarily immune, but if you look at Mike the Machine Bruce, he actually did hang himself as a feat of strength. You could even see it in this trailer, um, which was a DVD that he sold. He hung himself. He fucking hung himself. Not because he was suicidal, but to demonstrate that when you build a strong neck, it does prevent injuries. That's why if you're a fighter, train your neck. It'll help you. It'll prevent you from getting concussions and knock the hell out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so yes, neck training can definitely help with that. It can, it can save your life in a car crash. It can save your life in a fight. And uh, if, if someone were to ever try to hang you, well, you can, you can actually, you know, it's been done. You can, Mike Machine Bruce, just look at what he did. And I'm not advocating this. Don't even try this. And uh, I believe that if you were to be hung, like medieval style, you'd probably die anyway. Or it'd be, uh, you'd be suffering. You'd be just there, stuck for a long time. But um, yeah, neck training will definitely prevent injuries, 100%. Yo, Alex, what is the best way to build the killer serratus, ring push-ups, overhead press, or handstand stuff? Honestly, all that stuff. All of, all of it, all of it, all of it, yeah. I'd recommend that you do a lot of push-ups, a lot of rings. Guys, when you, get, when you get on those rings, you're gonna feel your serratus working like crazy. And you're gonna see it developing right before your very eyes. Uh, most bodyweight movements in general, and even the overhead press, absolutely. Overhead press, push press, all these things are going to benefit you tremendously. So yeah, I would train like a gymnast or just do a lot of bodyweight stuff. Basically, what you said is perfectly fine. You're going to get that nice serratus look. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very good. Yeah. Alex, what are your thoughts on loading up a rack pull heavier than your Warner Max and doing isometric holds for as long as you possibly can? Trying to lift the bar. Will this desensitize the goal guy 10 in Oregon? I love your comment, man. And this is something that I hypothesized a very long time ago, and I absolutely believe in this. I believe that you can desensitize the gold guy. I call it gold guy, okay? I'm self-fucking studied with this shit. I know it's called Golgi or whatever, but, or Golgi, I don't know. I call it gold guy, 10 in Oregon. So I 100% believe that partials will, will desensitize the area, as well as using bands, okay? And Dr. Mel Sif, the author of Super Training, theorized the same thing. In fact, he was going to test this with Louis Simmons, but unfortunately, he died. But you know what? I think that's a profound thing. The fact that we have old time strong men and people who've been lifting for so long who have this amazing level of strength from doing partials, natural guys, might I say so. And of course, I experienced it as well. Whenever I do partials, I feel super strong. Like you make me do a partial, one arm chin ups feel way easier. So I believe in from that perspective, okay? And also the fact that you have Dr. Mel Sif, one of the greatest, saying that it's quite possible that it might desensitize this area. Huh. Yeah, I think it absolutely can. And I, I'm a firm believer in partials for strength. I don't give a fuck what any of these goddamn studies say. I know from my experience and from what I've seen, and the strongest guys use some form of partial. Now, don't live on partials. Don't do them exclusively. Do some full range stuff. But have, having some overloads here and there, oh, it's definitely going to make you stronger. It, it will 100% do that. Imagine if you're doing Zercher holes with 1,000 pounds, holding that for time. Like, think about that. What it's going to do to your tendons and ligaments. Think of what it's going to do to your nervous system. Imagine if you could rack pull 2,000 pounds and rack. Everything's going to be light after that point. It's going to be a joke. You're strengthening everything. It's isometrics. It's all that stuff. So yeah, I 100% believe in partials. And I think that you're right on the money with what you said. And I also think that forearms, like a lot of forearm training and grip stuff does the same thing. So yeah, next question. If I begin to cut now, I'm over 20% body fat. Will I get visible abs by June or July? That's pretty soon. But yeah, I think you could. 100%. Um... If you're a true 20%, yeah, you'll, you'll probably see visible labs like at 15. And it won't take you that long to get there. Like you saw from me, guys, I was pretty fluffy. I was 186. I cut down to 160, okay? I range between 160 and 162, depending on how my appetite fluctuates. But I, I never go past that. And uh, yeah, my body fat dropped like crazy. Like I, I dropped more points than you can possibly imagine. So I think you do the same thing, man. It took me like four months to do it. Uh, you're, you're in a smaller, you're in a tighter window than me, but you can still go far enough to have some type of visibility in the abs. I don't think you're going to be shredded to the bone or anything, but you're going to have some, some definition, you know, which is pretty cool. Yeah. 
Can a standing one arm dumbbell press replace a standing barbell overhead press for size and strength? The term replace is kind of strong, but uh, yeah, I would say it could. Yeah, imagine if you're doing 100 pounds, one arm overhead for reps. You, your shoulders are going to be strong as hell. Real talk. It's strict. It builds your core strength. It's like it's dead stop. You can't go wrong with it. Now, do I recommend this? No, no, not really, man. I think you should be doing with the barbell version. I think it's generally superior. But uh, honestly, you can't go wrong with the one arm dumbbell press. I love it myself. I love that exercise to death. You see me do 90 pounds for reps on that. You see me do 100 pounds, my right arm. I always got great gains from doing that lift. Now, it didn't have the most carryover for me in terms of like regular overhead press, but it did seem to like maintain my performance. So uh, from that perspective as well, you're going to be fine. And it really is a great mass builder, a great strength builder. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be okay with that. But I would more so use that as an accessory lift. So do your regular overhead press or maybe a push press, you know, uh, Z press, stuff like that. And then right after, you could do your one arm overheads. But it's a great builder and you can't go wrong with it. It's time tested. It really is. All the old school grades did this. So yeah, give it a shot. What do you think about a penley style T-bar row? So you focus on the explosive concentric and remove the eccentric essentially. Yeah, this is fantastic. And this is, uh, I, I used to do this a lot. It's just dead stop training. You know, we call it the penley row, but it's just, it's a dead stop row. It's a concentric based row. And we can do this with every exercise. We can do dead stop overhead press, you know, off pins. We could do dead stop squats. We could do dead stop anything. So if you want to do your T-bar rows where you just do the concentric really fast, then you just like kind of let go of it almost. So it just touches the ground and you repeat over and over again. That's a great idea, man. And you can't go wrong with it. Is it good to do boxing three times a week in your novice program, excluding squats twice a week? Excluding squats is going to be better on your recovery. So I think you should be fine with that. Yeah, you, you, you'll probably be fine. Yeah. Um, but just what I would do though is possibly remove the accessories and lower your volume. Use the lowest possible volume listed for that program. And I think with that, just because you're removing the squats, a three times a week aggressive boxing program should be fine. So yeah, I, I think that's gonna work. I really do. Is heavy dumbbell pec fly safer way to stretching? Uh, I don't know, man, I, I, don't, I don't think so, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so, man. If you look at Athlete Nexus video on the dumbbell fly, first of all, the way a lot of guys are doing it, it's ruining the shoulders right off the bat. And if you're going to be doing stretch overloads, with like 100 pounds or something, I think you're gonna ruin your shoulders. So I I wouldn't recommend that. No, don't don't even mess with it. If you really wanna do that, do, just do the nether uh, chest shrug or um, do it with bands maybe. But uh, heavy overloads in the fly, it just sounds like an injury waiting to happen. Yo, Alex, what are the intermediate standards for weighted dips? You see, man, there's not enough people, like we don't know, N nobody knows. The best thing you can do is experiment with your own body and find out when does linear progression cease. That might be like 90 pounds. I would say 90 pounds is an intermediate dip. I don't know. Depends on your body weight. Depends on how much calisthenics experience you have. It, it varies so much. So there are no crazy standards on this. All, all we really have are the elites to compare ourselves to. We have the elites and people are just plain mediocre at dips, you know? Uh, so it's hard to compare. Sorry. But yeah, just keep going. When linear progression ceases, that's when you know you're intermediate. It's the same thing as bench press. I just got a 30 kilogram sandbag. If I stick this on my bag doing push-ups, will I be a bull? I think so. You'll be a bull if you just do regular push-ups without any weight whatsoever. If you do enough volume, you're gonna get a really nice chest. Your shoulders and triceps are gonna look good as well. Now you're not gonna have the most optimal physique of all time, but you can get very jacked with push-ups. And just look at prisoners, man. They exemplify this perfectly, you know? So if you're adding 30 kilograms, that's, that's, yeah, that's gonna add up, bro. That's gonna add up for sure. Especially if you're doing high volume and you're doing different variations like diamond push-ups, incline, all these things like that. Yeah, bro, you're gonna get great gains off that. No doubt, no doubt. And it's cheap too. You can go to Home Depot and do this. You know, it's a great idea, honestly. So yeah, next question. Alex, what is the best for hamstring mobility? I could tell you that weighted stretching is gonna do this like crazy. So your stiff-legged deadlifts, your Romanian deadlifts, even deep deficit stiff legs and deficit Romanians, all kinds of hamstring flexibility will be built. In addition to doing things like ass grass squats, guys will think about it, but the more you can do these amazing variations, greater your hamstring flexibility. If you look at Olympic weightlifters, they exemplify this. So you want to do weighted stretching to build up your hamstrings. And also a really good stretch that I found is you lay a barbell, say in a power rack, you put your leg on top of it, and you just stretch, and you get in a deeper and deeper position. You can even lie down on your back, okay, and lay it up against the wall. 
and just focus on dragging that leg up. That's really going to stretch out those hammies. Basically, martial arts type training tends to be very good for this. Uh, and there's a lot of good mobility drills you can look up online, as well as doing weighted stretching and the Olympic weightlifting stuff. Okay, that tends to build really good hamstring flexibility. Any tips on how to reduce dizziness when training the neck? Yeah, I've heard a couple people report this. For me, I I, I don't get dizzy. You can spin me around a million times. I, I don't get dizzy, man, uh, even after eating. So I think there's a genetic component to that. Uh, some people say it's these little things in your, your ears. I, I don't understand how this fully works. But I think that if you train your neck long enough, the dizziness will go away. And also there's certain practices that you can do which will reduce the dizziness, such as using a slower tempo and not overemphasizing the range of motion. So when you do your neck curls, don't be like going all the way back here, okay? Keep it less, so more of a partial, and don't be going like this fast, okay? Slow it down a little bit, maybe focus more on the squeezing, like bodybuilder style, if you will, and I think that's gonna help a lot with dizziness, okay? And of course, just get used to it. Over time, you're not gonna get dizzy. All right, folks, last question of the week. What do you think about Athlean X hamstring curl video and how bad the exercise is? Okay, I haven't seen the video, but from what people have told me, essentially he's saying that the lying hamstring curl is problematic for the lower back and even the, the hamstrings, I believe. Um, I agree, 100%. And I never did the exercise. I figured this out years ago with experience. Like the first time I went in the gym and I was looking at these stupid bodybuilding routines, they're like, oh, you got to do lying uh, leg curl. Whenever I would do that, I would have serious knee pain every single time. And it just never felt right. Now, in regards to lower back, first time I hear about it, but you know, it sounds plausible. I'll believe what Athlean X has to say about this. I love his channel. He makes good content when he talks about injury prevention for the most part. So I'll believe him on that. And in regards to the knees, yeah, totally, man. It's just, it's not a natural thing when you're lying down and you're using that awkward uh, strength curve. I find that just sitting down is much better and just standing up. Like for me, I do all my leg curls standing up now. I stand up, I put on ankle weights and I use perfect form and I get... Like it just feels natural. When it's a natural movement pattern for your build, aka not using a stupid machine, it feels way better. And again, that's just, that's just my personal experience, but uh, I haven't seen Athlean X's video, but I have no doubt that it's on point. If that's what you're talking about, knee pain and lower back pain, then you know what? I'll give it to Jeff. I'll trust what he has to say. So with that said, folks, hope you enjoyed this Q&A video. I thought the questions were fantastic. Put some more down below and I'll answer them all next week.